if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Let us confess our sins, Almighty God. Mighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against thy holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we've done those things we ought not to have done, and there's no health in us. Apart from your grace, apart from justification and your strength. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent and humble according to thy promises declared to your people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, sober, strong, powerful manner to the glory of thy great name. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he confess his sins and live, has declared in his holy word that he absolves continuously those who truly repent and truly embrace his Son. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as it was on the day of provocation. This is the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with that generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Our Psalter election begins with Psalm 26, 1 through 4. 
This psalm, for the most part, is similar to the preceding. The prophet oppressed with numerous wrongs and finding no succor in the world implores the aid of God, entreating him to take the cause of man unrighteously afflicted and assert his innocence. But as this contest was with the hypocrites, he appeals to the judgment of God, sharply reproving them for making a false profession in God's name. In the conclusion, as he had obtained his wish, he promises a sacrifice of praise to God for his deliverance. Verses 1 through 4. Judge me, O Jehovah, because in my integrity I have walked. And in Jehovah have I trusted, I shall not stumble. Prove me, O Jehovah, and try me. Examine my reins and heart. For thy goodness is before my eyes. Therefore I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with men of vanity. And with crafty men I will not go in. And we were on Levitical cities. believe we are done with Leviticus as we turn now to Numbers give me a second Book of Numbers The fourth book of the Pentateuch called In the Wilderness by the Jews after the first significant word. The Hebrew title is more meaningful than the English for the book picks up the story of the wilderness wandering after the arrival at Sinai, Exodus 19, and tells the story of Bedouin-like travels of Israel through 40 years of wandering. So we pick up. Those 40 years of wandering in the book of Numbers on our next occasion. And we finish up our story on the Levitical cities, 48 of them scattered throughout Canaan. And they were teaching centers that was the, as well as priests who were to know the canon and teach the people the history of redemption from the fall up until the comes into into the conquest. Of course, to emphasize this teaching aspect of the Levitical ministry is not to dimin diminish other aspects of their ministry with respect to the Ark and the central sanctuary, in particular, the political dimension. Certainly, the Levitical desire to secure Israel's loyalty to the Lord of the Covenant would also imply a commitment to secure loyalty to the Lord's anointed, the King. A good example of the proper blending of political involvement and covenant fellowship and teaching is in 2 Corinthians 17, 2 Chronicles 17, I apologize. Here the godly king Jehoshaphat sends out his princes and a number of prominent Levites to teach and further the work of reformation. And they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. And they went through the, all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. And tonight we'll pick up the discussion, God willing, tonight of the book of Leviticus, the third of five books by Moses, which teaches emphatically and clearly the penal, substitutionary, vicarious atonement, um, which is lambasted by the decadent Protestants in the seminaries, including Bishop. N.T. Wright, renamed 
Bishop N.T. wrong. Turn now to the first book of the Pentateuch, Genesis, chapter 15, 1 through 6, and the, the uh, revelation, unilateral revelation and establishment of the covenant of grace with Abram, or re- Iteration of the covenant, maybe we might say. Whilst the protection of his wife in Egypt was a practical pledge of the possibility of his having posterity and the separation of Lot, followed by the conquest of the kings of the east, which we've already covered in Genesis 14, was also the pledge of the possibility of his one day possessing the promised land. There was as yet no prospect whatever of that promise being realized in Abraham's own life. In these circumstances, anxiety about the future might naturally arise in Abraham's mind and soul and feelings. To meet this, the word of the Lord came to him with this comforting assurance. Fear not, Abraham. <clears throat> I am thy shield. But when the Lord added these words, and thy great reward, Abraham could only reply as he thought of his childless situation. Hi, Mario. N.T. wrong. So funny, but so true. N.T. right is N.T. wrong. I don't think I really, really, really suspect at heart whether he is genuinely a Christian who has felt his own depravity and sins and cried out for justification. I would like to ask the question personally to the bishop. Back to Abram. Abram can only reply, Lord Jehovah, what will you give me seeing that I go child? Of what avail are all my possessions, my wealth and power, seeing that I have no child and the heir of my house is Eleazar in Damascus. Shemek is synonymous with Mim Shek, possession, the siege of possession. Eleazar of Damascus, Eliezer is an explanatory opposition to Damascus in the sense of the Damascus Eliezer. Rohashef, on account of its position before Elohzar, cannot be taken grammatically as the equivalent of Da Mashike. To give still more distinct utterance to his grief, Abraham adds in verse 3. Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed, no children, and lo, I am an inmate of my own house. The word of the Lord came to him, not he, but one who shall come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. God then took him into the open air and told him to look up into the heavens and promised him children and posterity as numerous as the innumerable hosts of the sky. Whether Abraham at this time was in the body or out of the body, in a visionary state or not, is a matter of no moment. The reality of the occurrence is the same in either case. This is evident from the remark made by Moses, who was the historian of this event as to the conduct of Abram in relation to the promise of God. And Abraham believed Jehovah, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He trusted, he rested, his confidence was founded in Jehovah. And God looked favorably upon him and treated him as a justified man. God gave him not just the promise, but also the genuine, transforming, lively faith. 
We now turn in the book of Judges several hundred years later, many hundred years later, uh, in Genesis 8, and we're talking about Gideon, one of the judges who has conquered the Gideonites. And they're talking here about a garment. Simla, the upper garment, was for the most part a large square piece of cloth. The weight of these golden rings amounted to 1,700 shekels, or about 50 pounds, separate from, besides the remaining booty, for which Gideon had not asked, and which the Israelites had kept for themselves. And the purple clothes which were worn by the kings of Midian, which they had on, and also from the neck bands upon their neck, of their camels. Instead of on a coat or necklaces, the Saharanim, the little moons upon the necks of the camels, are mentioned in chapter 8, verse 21, as the more valuable portion of these necklaces, the sum of the booty from the conquest of the Midianites. Even at the present day, Arabs are accustomed to ornament the necks of these animals with a band of cloth or leather, upon which small shells called cowries are strung or sewed in the form of a crescent. The sheiks add silver ornaments to these, which make a rich booty in time of war. The Midianitish kings had their camels ornamented with golden crescents. This abundance of golden ornaments will not surprise us when we consider that the Arabs still carry their luxurious tastes for such things to such great excess. Wellstead states that the women in Oman spend considerable amounts in the purchase of silver ornaments and their children are literally laden with them. I've sometimes counted 15 earrings on each side, and the head, breast, arms, ankles are adorned with some profusion. As the Midianitish army consisted of 130,000 men, of whom 15,000 only, remained at the commencement of the last engagement. The Israelites may have collected 5,000 golden rings, maybe more. Chapter 8, verse 27. And Gideon made it into an ephod, used the gold of the rings obtained from the booty for making the ephod. There's no necessity, however, to understand this as signifying 1,700 shekels or 50 pounds, but simply that the making of the ephod was accomplished with this gold. The word ephod does not signify an image of Jehovah or an idol, as Cassinius and others maintain, but the shoulder dress of the high priest no doubt including the kosen belonging to it, with the urim and thummim, thumim. The material for this was worked throughout with gold threads. In addition to that, there were precious stones set in gold braid upon the shoulder pieces of the ephod and chains made of gold twist for the fast fastening of the chosen upon the ephod the story of the deliverance and protection of the covenant people continues in Judges. Well, we now turn to Isaiah. <clears throat> We're in a new chapter of Isaiah 11, and we are in a great section here of dealing with the prophecy of the Messiah. Wonderful. He's coming. Look forward to reverse the curse upon mankind and upon his people. We've already read chapter 11, 1 through 9. We'll now work through the details. 
that the Messiah should in due time come from the house of David as that branch of the Lord which he had said should be excellent and glorious. The word Netzer, which some think referred to in Matthew 2.23, which I think, where it is said that is spoken by the prophets of Messiah that he should be called a Nazarene. Observe here what, what whence this branch should arise from Jesse. That is, he should be a son and a descendant of K King David, with whom the covenant of royalty was made. I refer you to 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, and other places. And to whom it was promised by a divine and infallible oath that he should arise from his loins, God would raise up the Messiah, the Christ. Acts 2, verse 30, showing the understanding of the Davidic, the promise to the Davidic house. David is often called the son of Jesse, and Christ called also because he was one not only of the son of David, but David himself, Hosea 3, verse 5. Now the meanness or the lowliness of his appearance, he's called a rod or a branch. Both these words signify a weak, small, tender product, a twig, a sprig, such as is easily broken off. The enemies of God's church were just before compared to strong and stately bows, which will not without great labor be hewn down. But Christ is a tender branch. He shall be victorious over them. He is said to come out of Jesse rather than David, because Jesse lived and died in meanness and obscurity. His family was small and of no account. And it was in the way of contempt and reproach that David was sometimes called the son of Jesse. We will continue to explore the great messianic promise made in 740 BC, one among many promises in the Old Testament of the sovereign God, bringing forward salvation to the son of David. We turn now to Jehannam theology. We've been talking about the names of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, which we were just referring to, and then time will come to the Son of God. A few comments here on the Son of Man, Jesus. The view of the Jehannam, Son of Man, is related to the Urmensch of Oriental and Gnostic speculation is found in several writers. Dodd gives the theory a more philosophic presentation. He, according to this view, the idea used by John is that of a being who is the archetype of the human race, the real man, the platonic ideal of man and the inclusive representative of ideal or rede redeemed humanity. This philosophical understanding of the title seems most unlikely in the general context of Jehannan thought. But Dodd is on sure ground when he proceeds to draw the idea of the Son of Man from the use of the servant passages in Isaiah, and there are many of those messianic promises in the later portions of Isaiah 42, 49, 52, or 53, where God gives partial glimpses, further glimpses on his promises. We turn now in the New Testament to Matthew 5, and we have begun chapter 9. <clears throat> where Jesus heals the palsy man, and then he calls Matthew 
And he goes and he eats with the publicans and sinners. Jesus, he saw a man named Matthew. The writer of this precious gospel that we're studying, who here, with singular modesty and brevity, relates the story of his own calling. In Mark and Luke, he is called Levi, according to the preferable reading, Levine which seems to have been his family name. In their lists of the 12 apostles, however, Mark and Luke give him the same, the name of Matthew, which seems to have been the name by which he was known as Jesus' disciple. While he himself sinks his family name, he is careful not to sink his occupation that is, the obnoxious associations that would take place over against the grace which called him out of that life and made him, instead of being a tax collector, turned him into an apostle of the Messiah, whose great name we've been talking about, the great titles, Messiah, Son of David, the Danielic Son of Man and the Son of God. Mark alone tells us that he was a son of Alphaeus, the same probably with the father of James the Less. From this and other considerations, it's pretty certain that he must have at least heard of our Lord before this particular meeting. Unnecessary doubts, even from the early period, have been raised about the identity of Levi and Matthew. No English jury with the evidence before them, which we have in the gospel, would hesitate in giving a unanimous verdict of his identity, that it was Matthew whom Luke calls, by whom Luke calls him Matthew. We'll think more about Matthew's calling to the apostle, apostolate. When we continue our considerations, we'll finish this Acts 1, 6 through 11, as the disciples see Jesus ascending to heaven and the two angels in white glistening robes give some further commentary. That just as you have seen him go, so he shall in like manner return, which we continue as Christians to confess. This same Jesus, says the two apostles, two angels, shall come again in his own person clothed with a glorious body. This same Jesus, they say, who came once to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself will appear a second time without sin who once came in disgrace to be judged he will this time come again in glory this same Jesus who has given you your charge and commandment will again come to call you to account on how you have performed your duties he and not another. He shall come in like manner, the two angels say. He has gone away in a cloud, attended by angels. And when he comes a second time, he will come in the clouds, and with him an immeasurable, innumerable company of angels. He has gone up with a shout and with the sound of a trumpet, and he shall also descend from heaven with a shout and the trumpet of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 You've now lost sight of him into the clouds and in the air. And whither he is gone you cannot follow. But shall then, when you shall, you shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When we stand gazing and trifling, consideration of our master's second coming should quicken, animate, vivify, encourage, 
and fortify us. And when we stand gazing and trembling, the consideration of it should comfort, strengthen, and encourage us. And tonight we'll pick up Acts 1, 12 through 14. We shift now to the epistle of the Roman to of Paul to the Romans. Um, good morning, Dr. Bob. Glad to have both you and Mario here. And we continue with Prof Hodge on Romans 6, verse 6, at our union with Christ. We are united to Christ as our head and representative so as to be partakers of his death and resurrection as a matter of law or of right. What is thus done, as it were, out of ourselves is attended by an analogous spiritual expression. This knowing, this experiencing this, our inward experience agrees with this doctrinal statement. Our old man, that is our corrupt nature, as opposed to the new man, our holy nature, which is the product of regeneration or the effect of our union with Christ. In Ephesians 4, 22 and 24, we are exhorted to put off the old man and put on the new man, Colossians 3. Eight and nine. The scriptures everywhere assert or assume the fall and native depravity of man. We are born the children of wrath. We are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, without God and without hope. This inward state and outward condition in which every man comes into the world through the redemption that is in Christ, a radical change is effected. Old things will pass away and all things become new. The old man, the nature which is prior to the order of, in the order of time, as well as corrupt, is crucified. And a new nature, new and holy, is induced. The word man is used here because it, because it is no one disposition, tendency, or faculty that is changed, but the very man himself, the radical principle of his being, the self. Hence, Paul uses the pronoun I. I am sold under sin. I cannot do the things that I would. It is plain from this whole representation that regeneration is not merely a change of acts or change of the affections in distinction from the understanding, but is a change of the whole man. Another thing is also plain, namely, that such a radical change of nature cannot fail, cannot fail but to manifest itself in a new, holy, regenerate, life, way of thinking, walking, choosing. This is what Paul here insists upon. To the believer who knows that the old man is crucified with Christ, that the objection that gratuitous Justification leads to licentiousness is completely contradictory and totally absurd. The old man is said to be crucified, not because the destruction of the principle of sin is a slow and painful process, but because Christ's death was by crucifixion, in which death we were associated and because it is from him, as crucified, the death of sin in us proceeds. And then from the text of verse 6, that the body of sin might be destroyed. This body of sin is only another name for the old man, or rather 
or its concrete form. The design of our crucifixion with Christ is the destruction of the old man, the destruction of the body of sin, its equivalent, and the design of the destruction of the inward power of evil is our emancipation, liberation, and freedom. This latter idea the apostle expresses by saying that henceforth we should not serve sin. We should not be in bondage to it. The service of sin is called lulea, that is a slavery a state from which we cannot free or liberate ourselves. It is a power which coerces obedience despite the resistance of reason, conscience, and as the apostle teaches, even the will. It is a bondage from which we can be delivered in no other way than by the death of the inward principle of evil and the death of bondage to evil which possesses, controls, and governs our choices and our nature and lies behind that of the choices of the will which can be destroyed only by our union with Christ in his death who died for this very purpose that he might deliver us from the bondage of corruption and introduce us into the glorious liberty, freedom, and emancipation through Christ. Compare John 8, 34, Hebrews 2, 14, and 16. Although the general sense of this verse is thus plain, there's a great diversity of opinion regarding the precise meaning of the words soma te hamartias, the body of sin. Some say it should mean the sinful body, that is, the body which is the seat and source of sin. But it is not the doctrine of the Bible that sin has its source in matter. It is, a sp it is spiritual in its nature and its origin, and we'll pick up with the issue of the seat, source of sin as bondage, the inner man from which we are liberated by our precious union with Christ, which brings with it several, several other benefits, justification being the predicate the foundation. Well, we turn now <clears throat> in our studies to the pre-Socratic philosophers, which we need to know in order to do some theology, some, because this arises in the history of theology. It gets a little wonky here, but we soldier on. Let us suppose that Achilles and a tortoise are going to have a race. Since Achilles is a sportsman, he gives the tortoise a start. Now, by the time that Achilles has reached the place from which the tortoise started, the latter has again, again advanced to another point. And when Achilles reached that point, then the tortoise will have advanced still another distance, even if it's very short. Thus, Achilles is always coming nearer to the tortoise, but never actually overtakes it and never can do so. On the supposition that a line is made of an infinite number of points, talking about geometry and space and time, on the Pythagorean hypothesis, then, Achilles will never catch up to the tortoise. And so, although they assert the reality of motion, they make it impossible on their own doctrine. By the way, we're working with the Jesuit philosopher and theologian, Fred Compelstone. Good morning, Jesus. Name above all names. Great to see all of you. 
men in here and any women who might be here too. Suppose a moving arrow. According to the Pythagorean theory, the arrow should occupy a given position in space. The fourth argument of Zeno, which we know from Aristotle, is, as Sir David Ross says, very difficult to follow, <laughs> partly owing to the ambiguous language in Greek, by Aristotle partly owing to the doubts as to the right readings. We have to represent to ourselves three sets of bodies on a stadium in a race course. One set is stationary, the other two are moving in opposite directions with equal velocity. Well, I'm sure that's been very inspiring. All of that leads up to Plato and Aristotle who figure into subsequent theological studies. And we continue <clears throat> shifting now to systematic theology with a brief historical review of the dogmatic and decadent man. I'm increasingly using that word these days for the enlightenment philosophers rather than to speak favorably to call, call them colorfully what they are, decadent in which Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, said we can know nothing, absolutely nothing, about the supernatural world, including God, including his divine acts in history, thus setting the table with the plates, the glasses and the spoons and the forks, for later decadent Protestant theology, which was against miracles, as if God was in a wheelchair, a double amputee, a broken arm, and on an oxygen tank, a broken, busted God. And that's where the naive, decadent Protestants in the seminaries went. It's a long process, but now we see it working out in the worthless leadership positions in the decadent Protestant communions of Methodism, the liberal Presbyterians, the awful Episcopalians, and I could go on. So let's turn to a little consideration of man. I call him Manny. It's Emmanuel. Latin term which means God with us. Immanuel Kant, I believe he was born into a pious German Lutheran home and then was corrupted through philosophy. Kant rejected the traditional arguments for the existence of God, who's surprised there. He argued <clears throat> that the cosmological argument that is, the argument that part goes from causation to the first cause, and the teleological argument that goes from evidence of design and creation to a great designer, rested upon the illegitimate ontological argument. The latter argument appealed to reason, and Anselm of Canterbury used it, to infer the existence of God from the notion of God as the most perfect being on the grounds that the latter would not be the most perfect being if it did not exist. Kant believed that the ontological argument rested on a tautology, which merely defined God as necessarily existing perfect being without supplying any reason for thinking that such a being did actually exist. What we see here is a corrupt man holding down the truth as God reveals himself. And God allows the camp to work out of his corrupt state of mind, even though he continuously reveals himself to Kant. What we see before us is a man 
engaged in psychological repression. Kant, it could no more prove the existence of God by asserting the existence than a merchant could increase his wealth merely by writing zeros in his ledger. Kant maintained that the cosmological and teleological arguments tacitly appealed to a deontological argument in order to convert the ideas of first cause and great designer into an actual existing first cause and great designer. We'll pick up more of the picture of active repression. I love tuning into here. Speaking of hearing, I have a difficult time hearing, even if I turn up the volume all the way. Perhaps a lapel microphone would be a great solution. Let me look into that. I will try to uh, consider that. And I'll try also to speak a little louder. I, I might note that I took a trip to Detroit and I was able to tune into YouTube for the 15 hour drive. And so there and back, I got about 30 hours of listening, not to myself, but listening to the men who speak and who we, whom we wish to hear. And now in systematic theology, we turn to Professor Charles Hodge of old Princeton. I hope to get my grandson up to Princeton to see the cemetery there with all the old men buried in it. We'll see. The knowledge of God is not due to a process of reasoning, and that goes to Kant. Kant knew God, but he didn't want him in his thoughts, as we learn in Romans 1, 18 to 22. He did not like, did not love having God, the sovereign creator that speaks in nature. Calvin has a wonderful statement where he talks about tributaries and rivers and lakes and flowers and fields and grasses and trees and bushes all the way up to the skies and the stars and the sun and the moon. He, it's a wonderful citation in Calvin where he tells us that the book of nature talks in our ears every day. That even the unregenerate man hears that, but like Immanuel Kant, he does not want to hear that word, so he is an active suppressor. So we turn to Hodge on this point, which we already know from studying Romans. Let's hear what Charles says. Those who are unwilling, good word, to admit that the idea of God is innate, as given in the constitution of man, generally hold that it is necessary, or at least a natural deduction of reason. Sometimes it's represented as the last and highest generalization of science, as the law of gravitation is assumed to account for a large class of phenomena in the universe, and as it is not not only does account for them, but must be assumed in order to understand them. So the existence of an intelligent first cause is assumed to account for the existence of the universe itself. But as such generalizations are possible only for the cultivated minds, this theory of the origin of the idea of God cannot account for belief in his existence in the minds of all men, even amongst the least educated. Others, therefore, while regarding this knowledge to be the result of reasoning, make the process far more simple, as does St. Paul. There are many things which children and illiterate persons learn and can hardly avoid learning which need to not be referred to the constitution of the nature. Thus, the existence of God is so obviously manifested 
Why? Because God himself does the revealing. Again, close study of Romans 118 and following. And by everything within and everything around us, the belief in the existence is so natural, so suited to what we see and what we need that it comes to be generally adopted. We are surrounded by facts which indicate design, by effects which demand a cause. And I'm reminded here, I have an MD friend that I was talking to, Bob, he was an MD. And he told me there were two instances in experiments where men had a baby implanted in them, an embryo or some stage of birth. But, and the men carried these babies, I don't know if to fruition or not, but it took tons and tons and tons of medical doctoring. My doctor friend said, it just proves that men were made to be men and women were made to be women and women were biologically designed and created uniquely, wonderfully, and grandly to be those who carry and deliver babies. That was my the front, and it goes to the issue we hear of today of men becoming pregnant. The MD friend just shot that down in a heartbeat. And so it goes to this as design you see in the design even of the biological process of men and women and creating a baby. Effects which demand a cause. We have a sense of the infinite in our minds, which is vague and void until filled with God. We have a knowledge of ourselves as spiritual beings, which suggests the idea of God. We have the consciousness of <clears throat> of moral qualities, which we see in the emergence of the common law tradition and legal codes, which arises out of our moral dimension. And this makes us think of God as being uh, and having moral perfections of right and wrong. <clears throat> All this may be very true, but it is not a satisfactory account of the case. It does not give us a satisfactory reason for the universality and strength of the conviction in every man and woman of the existence of God. Our own consciousness teaches us that this is not the ground of our faith. We do not thus reason ourselves into the belief that there is a God. It is very obvious that it is not by the process of ratiocination, simple as it is, that the mass of people are brought over to this conclusion. And we'll pick that up as we ponder this innate God-given knowledge of his being. There's no such thing as an atheist. An atheist is simply a sophisticated liar. No such thing as an agnostic. That's simply an indifferent liar, but a liar in bondage to his or her own sin, knowing God, because God makes himself known to them. We turn now, we're talking about millennial views. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at the different forms of post-millennialism, the second coming in the larger topic, the seventh locus of systematic theology. The latter form of post-millennialism, a great deal of present-day post-millennialism is of an entirely different type. It concerns itself very little about the teachings of scripture, except as a historical indication of what people once believed. The modern man has little patience with the millennial hopes of the past, with its utter dependence on God. He does not believe that the new age will be ushered in by the preaching of the gospel and the accompanying work of the Holy Spirit. And kind of more like in the Episcopal world that we are the ones who bring in the kingdom by our Pelagian 
works. Yes, they're fully and officially pelagic. You, you can bank on it. Nor that it will result be the result of a cataclysmic change. On the one hand, it is believed that evolution will gradually bring in the millennium. And on the other hand, that man himself must himself usher in the new age by adopting a constructive policy of world betterment, often called progressivism, as thousands or a thousand babies will be slaughtered today by murderers with MD degrees and nurses with BSNs and RN degrees, sponsored by pagans, unregenerate, unconverted, accursed, adjudged, guilty, and damn worthy medical people and judges, politicians. Quote, says Walter Rauschenbusch, our chief interest in any millennium is the desire for a social order in which the worth and freedom of every human being will be honored and protected. You see right there, there's no concept of sin, no sense of the bondage and the shackles of depravity that we learn in Romans 1. That's why we're studying Romans so vigilantly and diligently and God willing for the rest of this old fellow's life to always have Romans front and center in which the brotherhood of man, there's little Adolf von Harnock, will be expressed in the common possession of economic resources of society. And you can see there the vulnerability to Marxism. And in which the spiritual good of humanity will be set high above profit interests of all materialistic groups. As to the way in which the Christian ideal of society is to come, we must shift from the catastrophic to that of evolution and development. Shirley Jackson Case, she's from the University of he's from the Sh University of Chicago, founded with Roosevelt money, as a distinct school dedicated to what was called modernism which we have chosen to call decadent Protestantism. Shall we look for God to introduce a new order by catastrophic means, or shall we assume the responsibility of bringing about our own millennium, believing that God is working in us and in our world to will and work of his good pleasure? Close quote. And he himself gives the answer in the following paragraphs. This is Shirley Jackson. The course of history exhibits one long process of evolving struggle, maybe some Hegelianism there, by which humanity as a whole rises constantly higher in the scale of civilization and attainment. This will not stand historical scrutiny. World War I and World War II took the wind out of the sails of these progressivists, and now we've got millions being killed in abortion centers. We still have Islam, Islamicism on the run or in, in the world. We have Russia and China. So this is sheer di utopian, dystopian utopianism. Viewed in the long perspective of the ages, man's career has been one of actual ascent. Instead of growing worse, the world is to be found to be constantly growing better. Here you see the pride of the academy. Since history and science show that betterment is always the work of achievement, man learns to surmise that evils still unconquered are to be eliminated by strenuous effort and gradual reform rather than by catastrophic intervention of the deity. Disease is to be cured and prevented by the physician's skill. Societies are to be remedied by education and legislation. 
No. We still remember Prof. A. A. Hodges' quote from the late 19th century, as public education was being formulated without reference to God, how he envisioned indubitably the development of a nihilistic, relativistic, and godless society such as we see before our eyes today. So sorry there, old boy, you just are dead wrong, Jackson. And international disasters are to be averted by establishing new standards and new methods for dealing with problems involved. In short, the ills of life are to be cured by a gradual process of remedial treatment than by sudden annihilation. And that's quite the misrepresentation of post-millennialists. These quotations are quite characteristic of a great deal of present-day post-millennialism, and it's no wonder that the pre-millenarians react against it. We'll pick that up tonight, God willing. Really quite dangerous among the decadent Protestants with their pride. We turn now to Prof. Raymond on God's decrees, which governs the entire universe from molecules to the rise and fall of nations. And he's been talking about uh, Clark Pinnock's proposal, which is open theism. Furthermore, if God only permits people to make the choices they do, he does it either willingly or unwillingly. If he permits them unwillingly, then one can only conclude that something is more powerful than God. And thus one loses God altogether, or rather, he places the more powerful thing that countermands God's will on God's throne in its stead. But if God willingly permits men to make the choices they do, knowing as he does all things that they will make sinful choices, and refuses to prevent them from making those choices, then Pinnock's assertion of divine permission as half of the solution to the problem of sin does not provide the solution it's supposed to yield for Clinic, Pinnock. Indeed, if God knows they will to make wrong choices before they do that, then their future acts are certain and can be nothing else but certain. And again, bare permission is again shown to be an inadequate irrelevancy. Finally, there are problems in his claim that men have free wills, understood as the ability or the power to choose any one of a reasonable, numerous, incompatible courses. There is simply no such thing as a will which is detached from and totally independent of the person making the choice, su suspended, so to speak, in midair and enjoying some extra personal advantages from which to determine itself. The will is the mind choosing, according to Jonathan Edwards, from which to determine itself. The will is the mind choosing. Men choose the things they do because of the complex, finite persons they are. They cannot will to walk on water or flap their arms and fly like a bird. They cannot go upwards when they jump off a bridge. Their choices in such matters are restricted by their physical capacities. Similarly, moral choices are also determined by the compl complexion of who they are. And the Bible informs us that men are not only finite, but are also now sinners who by nature cannot bring forth good fruit. By nature, they cannot hear Christ's word that they might have life, John 8, 43. 
by nature cannot subject themselves to the law of God. Romans 8, 7. It says that the carnal man cannot submit to the word of God. Or men who are by nature cannot discern the things of the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not understand the things of God. By nature cannot confess from the heart Jesus as Lord. By nature cannot control the tongue, James 3.8. By nature cannot come to Christ. In order to do any of these things, they must receive the powerful aid coming to them ab extra from the outside so there simply is no such thing as a free will which can always choose the right the bondage of man in relation to the decrees of god we now turn to the first century we're still talking about saint paul uh, and analogous conversions God deals with men according to their character and condition. As in Elijah's vision on Mount Horeb, God appears now in the mighty rush, rushing wind that uproots the trees, now in the earthquake that rends the rocks, now in the consuming fire, now in the still small voice. Some are suddenly converted. We can remember the place and the hour. Others are gradually and imperceptibly changed in spirit and conduct. Still others grow up unconsciously in the Christian faith from the mother's knee in the baptismal font. The stronger the will, the more force it requires to overcome the resistance and the more thorough and lasting the change. Of all sudden and radical conversions was that of Saul was the most sudden and most radical. In several respects, it's Saul, St. Paul. It stands quite alone as the man himself and in his work. Yet there are faint analogies in history. The divines who most sympathized with his spirit and system of doctrine passed through a similar experience and were much aided by his example and writings. Among these are Augustine, Calvin, and Luther, who are the most conspicuous. St. Augustine, the son of a pious mother and heathen father, was led astray into vice and error, and wandered for years through the labyrinth of heresy and skepticism. But his heart was restless and homesick after God. At last, when he attained unto the 33rd year of his life, September 386, the fermentation of his soul culminated in a garden near Milan, Italy, far away from his African home, when the Spirit of God, through the combined agencies of the unceasing prayers of Monica, the sermons of St. Ambrose, the example of St. Anthony, the study of Cicero and Plato, the study of Isaiah and Paul, brought about a change that was wonderful. For no visible appearance of Christ was vouchsafed to him, but as a sincere and lasting as that of the apostle. As he was lying in the dust of repentance and wrestling with God for deliverance, he suddenly heard a sweet voice from heaven calling and saying again, Take and read, take and read, Talalege, Talalege. He opened the holy book and read the exhortation of St. Paul. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh thereof to fulfill the lusts thereof. It was the voice of God through the epistle of Romans. He obeyed it. He completely changed. His course of life was changed. And he became the greatest and most useful teacher of his age. 
as we turn now to the Middle Ages, the discussion between the East and the West, Pope Leo. On his deathbed, re restored the deposed patriarch of Constantinople, a synod of Constantinople in 920, at which Pope John X was represented, declared a fourth marriage illegal and made no concessions to Rome. The Emperor Constantine, Leo's son, prohibited a fourth marriage by edict. The church regards the mar marriage as a sacrament and a necessary means for the propagation of the race. But a second marriage is prohibited to the clergy. A third marriage is tolerated in a layman as a sort of legal concubinage. And a fourth is condemned as sin and as a scandal. That's surely not very biblical. It's not Christian. The Pope acquiesced in the schism slumbered during the dark 10th century. The venal Pope John the 19th of 1024 was ready for an enormous sum of money to renounce all claim of superiority over the Eastern monarchs. Take and read is the heart of Sola Scriptura as it presupposes a unique character to what is being read as over against what is declared by bishops, popes, or councils. Yes, indeed, Sola Scriptura, and I can produce right now if I want to do 50 pages of one liners from all the great fathers down to, Aqu and including Aquinas of all things, and Gabriel B.L. This is the uh, middle of the high, age, high Middle Ages, Sola Scriptura. No kidding. One-liners, 50 pages. Yeah, and Thomas Cranmer read all those, and he came to that view, Sola Scriptura. Unfortunately, they didn't clean everything up. Well, we turn now to carry a lot. Here, Eularis and Leo the Ninth, and be more fights between the East and West. Michael Carularis was the patriarch from 1043 to 1059. He renewed and completed the schism. Heretofore, the mutual anathemas being thrown back and forth between Constantinople and Rome were hurled only against the contending heads and their party. And now the churches themselves excommunicated one another. The Emperor Constantius Monachus courted the friendship of the Pope for political reasons, but his patriarch checkmated him. Curularius, in connection with the learned Bulgarian Metropolitan Leo of Alcreta, addressed in 1053 a letter to John. Bishop of Trani in Apulia, then subject to Eastern rule, and through him to all the bishops of France and to the Pope himself, charging the churches of the West that, following the practice of the Jews and contrary to the usage of Christ, they employ in the Eucharist unleavened bread, that they fast on Saturday and Lent, that they eat blood and things strangled in violation of the decree of Jer Jerusalem, and that during the fast they do not sing hallelujah. Notice how minor some of these things are. He invented the new name, Ozymites, for the heresy of using unleavened bread instead of common bread. Nothing was said about the procession of the Spirit or the Filioque Clause in the Nicene Creed. The letter is only extant in the Latin translation of Cardinal Hubert. It was more, the real issue was pride, of preeminence, and who rules who. The same thing is seen in uh, the issues in England between the August Canterburyan crowd and the Celtic Christians. Now we pick up for Kelvin and Melanchthon. Melanchthon the weakling, Kelvin maintained his cordiality with Melanchthon. 
in the unfortunate affair of Servetus, Melanchthon fully approved of Calvin's conduct, 1554, as did the Roman Catholics. But during the Eucharistic controversy excited by Westphal, he kept an ominous silence, which produced a coolness between Calvin and Melanchthon. In a letter of August 3, 1557, Calvin complains that for three years he had not heard from him, but expresses satisfaction that he still entertained the same affection, and closes with a wish that he may be permitted to enjoy on earth a most delightful interview with you, and feel some alleviation of my grief by deploring along with you the evils which we cannot remedy. That wish was never granted. In a letter, November 9, 1558, he gives him, while still suffering from a quartan ague, a minute account of his malady, of the remedies of the doctors, of the formidable coalition of the kings of France and Spain against Geneva. And Calvin concludes with these words. Let us cultivate a sincerity, a fraternal affection towards each other, the ties of which no wiles of the devil shall ever burst asunder. By no slight shall my mind ever be alienated from that holy friendship and respect which I have vowed to you. Farewell, most illustrious light and distinguished doctor of the church. May the Lord always govern you by his spirit, preserve you long in safety, increase your store of blessings, in turn diligently commit, commend us to the protection of God as you see us exposed to the jaws of the wolf. My colleagues and innumerable crowd of pious men salute you. On 19 April 1560, Melanchthon was delivered from the truth, from the fury of the theologians and all his troubles. A year after his death, Calvin, who had to fight the battle of the faith four years longer, during the renewed fury of the Eucharistic controversy with the fanatical Hescuchius, addressed this touching appeal to his sainted friend in heaven. O oh, Philip Melanchthon, I appeal to thee, who now livest with Christ. Was this an invocation of a saint or simply an enconium? And we'll pick that up tonight. That's a troubling question. I don't think it is an invocation of the departed Melanchthon. We'll review that later. Now for a few comments on Thomas Cranmer and the issues going on with and Malin, and we pick up with what's going on with the closing of monasteries. Anne Boleyn opposed it. Thomas Cromwell is resigning her fall and leading Parliament toward the closure of monasteries. There's evidence of, this would be 1536, April and May, well, there is indeed evidence of confusion and delay in the process of implementing the parliamentary legislation on monastic dissolutions. First noticed three centuries ago by the ever astute Bishop Gilbert Burnett with his unerring eye for detail. The instructions for the visitors to carry out this monastic dissolution were not issued until April 28, 1536, after the writs for an entirely new parliament had been drawn up. Eric Ives has also made a convincing case for the view that one of the most serious issues of dispute between Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell was their different views as to what should be done with the monastic wealth raised by the confiscations and shutdowns. Anne had recruited Bishop Hugh Latimer to preach before the king, demanding that the windfall of profits be sent on education 
and the relief of the poor. Cranmer supported that. And Ive sees a clear allusion to Skip's Passion Sunday sermon to the same. One can see why the issue would have excited Cranmer, as Cranmer indicates in his letter to Cromwell of his agitation over religious matters. The word religious probably referring to this gross confiscation of lands and properties and monies and they're bringing them into the royal treasury with no concern for education or hospitality. Cranmer soon discovered that matters were even more serious than he originally knew. We can gather evidence for the stages of Anne Boleyn's doom. The secret commission of the Boyer and Terminer to investigate treason on 24 April. The sudden summons to attend the first elected parliament for seven years on 27 April. And on the same day, a consultation with Bishop Stokesley to see whether Henry could abandon Anne. The choice of Stokesley in a highly significant issue, it meant that Cranmer who was still down at his palace in Knoll, was being bypassed in favor of a bishop who had been consistently humiliated and marginalized by Cromwell and the evangelical bishops over the previous year. Eric Ives sees 27 April as the crucial day on which Henry was given the information which changed his mind on Anne's guilt and made him determined to destroy her. The most dramatic description of events after this is the eyewitness reminiscence of Cromwell and Cranmer's Scottish protege, Alexander Eliseus. This was written for Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, two years later. It begins with the frenzied activity of 30 April complete with the vignette of Anne with the baby princess still in her arms, pleading in vain with the implacable and determined king and the noise of the cannon from the tower, thundering out for the receipt of its most important prisoner, the first of Anne's alleged associates. And that story will go down with lightning like rapid speed within 30 days of April 28th. There will be a very complicated, short, but fast trial in which she's adjudged guilty of treason, her head chopped off. And in the same time period, Tom Cranmer will, like a lapdog, issue a nullity declaration. And like a lapdog will be involved in the coronation and re remarriage and coronation of Queen Jane, the new queen. He was a participant and an accessory to first degree homicide. Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. Good for many things, but also a failure. We <clears throat> Now turn to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Westminster Confession, Chapter 8, Paragraph 1 on Christ the Mediator. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, 
the priest and king, the head and savior of his church, the heir of all things and the judge of the world, unto whom he did from eternity give a people to be his seed and to be made by him in time and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, glory and glorious, and we would add, assured of ultimate victory through Jesus Christ. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Speaking of creeds, we turn to the formula of Concord, and we've been talking about ubiquitarianism or cannibalism and Lutheranism with Philip Schaff. Very plain that such an absolute omnipresence of the body proves much more than Luther intended and needed for his Eucharistic theory. Hence, he made no further use of it in his later writings and rested the real presence at last, as he did at the first, exclusively on the literal rendering of the words, this is my body. His earlier Christology was much more natural and left room for a real development of Christ's humanity. Melanchthon, in his later period, decidedly opposed the ubiquity of Christ's body and the introduction of, a sc of scholastic disputations on the subject into the doctrine of the Eucharist. He wished to know only of the personal presence of Christ which does not necessarily involve bodily presence. He also rejected the theory of the communicatio idiomatum, that is, the real or physical presence. Luther's Christa, um, let's see here, which leads to a confusion of natures and admitted with Calvin only a dialectical or verbal communication. Luther's Christology leaned to the Eutychian confusion, a lengthens to the Nestorian separation of the two natures. Wrong answer, Mr. Schaff. The renewal of the Eucharistic controversy by Westphal led to fought for fuller discussion of ubiquitarianism. The Orthodox Lutherans insisted upon ubiquity as a necessary result of the real communication of the properties of the divine natures of Christ, the divinization of the human nature and the human humanization of the divine nature. While the Philippists and Calvinists rejected it as inconsistent with the nature of a, the body of Christ, with the realness of Christ's ascension going from here to there, and with the general principle that the infinite cannot be comprehended or shut up in the finite. The colloquy at Malbron, these conflicting Christologies, at face-to-face -face at a colloquy in the cloister of Malbron in the Duchy of Württemberg, April 10, 1564, it was arranged by the by Duke Christopher of Württemberg and Elector Frederick III of the Palatinate, Olavianus or Sinus, the author of the Heidelberg Catechism, and Boquin defended the Reformed, the Swabian divines Andrea Brenz, Schnepf and Biedenbach, and Osiander, the Lutheran view. Five days were devoted to the discussion of the subject of ubiquity and one day to the interpretation of the words, this is my body. The Lutherans regarded ubiquity as the main pillar of their view of the Eucharistic presence. They still do. Andrea proposed three points for the debate, incarnation, ascension, and the right hand of God. They were clear thinkers, better than we have today. We turn now to our infallibilist friends in 605 
and 606, who always do better than the decadent Protestants. At the end of the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus recalled that God's love excludes no one. You can see they've thrown out double predestination. So it is not of the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He affirms that he came to give his life a ransom for many. This last term is not restricted, but contrasts the whole of humanity with the unique person of the Redeemer who hands himself over to us to save us. So they assert. The church following the apostles teaches that Christ died for all men without exception. False Gottschalk of Orbi and his followers did not believe that, nor did Augustine. So they've assumed the, the mantle of speaking for the entire church history in their solemn hubris again. There is not, never has been, and never will be a single human being for whom Christ did not suffer. Well, if you're going to talk about the definiteness of what happened, then you are in the ball camp of universalism. You like that JP2 and Benedict 16? The Arminians do. The Lutherans do. Christ offered himself to his Father for our sins. Christ's whole life is an offering to the Father. The Son of God who came down from heaven, not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him, said on coming into the world, Lo, I have come to do your will, O God. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Oh, there's no exegesis here. There's no Romans. From the first moment of his incarnation of the Son, the Son embraces the Father's plan of divine salvation in his redemptive mission. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. How about John 17? The work for those given to him. No, there's no, none of that here. The sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the whole world, without exegeting whole world, expresses his loving communion with the Father. The Father loves me because I lay down my life, said the Lord, for I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world, the nations, would be the way to read that, may know the Father. And so we're back to Reformed theology, which they have thrown out earlier in a discussion on universal sin. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us the full package of our salvation from election to glorification and victory in this life and in the world to come. For if God be for us, who can be against us? Lord, save your people. Mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with soundness of doctrine and with godliness of life and thought. Make thy chosen people joyful Bless thine inheritance, give peace in our time. O oh Lord, give peace to those children who will be killed today by the medical establishment and legal establishment. O oh God, for us and in the church, make our hope, cleanse our thoughts by the inspiration and might of thy Holy Spirit. Almighty God, who show us to those who are in error the light of thy Son and the light of thy word, to the intent that we may come again and again by way of thy righteousness. Grant to those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's church that they may avoid those things that are contrary to their profession. 
that they may follow such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, and knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, defend us, thy humble servants, in every assault of every enemy from any side, that we may never fear the onslaught and the assault of any enemy through the might and the majesty of the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this another day, defend us in this day by thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy mighty hand, may be righteous in thy sight, and that we may always do that which is pleasing before thy holy tribunal, wherein are, is gathered the church militant, or the church triumphant, and the angels and archangels above, serving thee, Lord Jesus Christ, our King, prophet, and priest, through whom we pray. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. And you've promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, you will hear their requests and what they ask. Fulfill those requests, O Lord, and grant unto them those things that are necessary and according to thy eternal will. Granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost dominate this day and days to come. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. Godspeed. And good as usual to have all who have attended as we think together as we serve Christ together, as we fight manfully under the banner of his cross against the nihilists. And again, with Prof. A. A. Hodge's reminder in the late 19th century, that education separated from theology, as was being proposed in that day of public education, free from theology. He prognosticated that we would face a world of nihilism, relativism, and anti-God thinking everywhere in this sin-rent world. And we see that in the media, in the academy, and maybe, maybe, oh, definitely among the decadent Protestants. Let us fight manfully and faithfully under the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Godspeed.